Jätteroligt att se att så många Sydasien vänner är här idag. Och a warm welcome to our fellow world citizens. And most of all, a warm welcome to Amitav Ghosh, the distinguished author. I think we give him an applaud to start with. And he will be interviewed by our cultural editor, Henrik Schedin, in a while. Just a short introduction about Sydasien. Our journal has been around since 1977, and it is today in print and online. And we have a booth over there at the Globala Torget, so you can find our journals over there. And also, of course, you can buy the books by Amitav after this uh, interview. So just hang around. Uh, short about the region, it is home to about 1.8 billion people uh, with growing economies and a growing demand for coal and solar power electricity. So it is putting a pressure on the countries in the region. You've seen the flooding in Pakistan and the flooding in uh, Bangladesh and uh, the heat wave in India and Pakistan this year. So there is uh, a growing, accelera accelerating uh, consequence of climate change. So we leave the floor to Henrik and Amitav and I hope you will stay and listen. Thank you, Johan. Uh, a short introduction of Amitav before we... So Amitav Ghosh is an Indian author, uh, mostly known for his fiction. Among them, the, we can mention the Ibis trilogy and Gun Island, which has been translated to Swedish by Palaver Press. And I believe that the last part of the trilogy will be published this coming winter in Swedish. Uh, these are truly great, this is truly great fric fiction uh, and with complex narratives, but today we are going to talk about your non-fiction, namely The Great Derangement or Den Stora Galenskapen, as it is translated to in Swedish. Uh, to make a very brief summary, this is a book of both great depth and content. Uh, since it's an, it's a, it is an essay on the, about climate change, how we humans can try to understand it and how we are crazy enough to ignore it, basically. And uh, I also read it as a history of our global modernity, in a way. Very well welcome, Amitav. Thank you very much, much Hen Henrik. Uh, to start with, uh, you write that culture creates desires, uh, desires that leads to consumption and energy consumption, which in turn speeds up climate change due to more emissions. Uh, for example, you make an example of uh, Peter Fonda on a motorcycle driving into the desert or the books about of Jack Kerouac who creates desires to be somebody else or uh, be an image of something. So what is the role of culture in climate change? Uh, culture is absolutely fundamental uh, in climate change because so many of our uh, <coughs> consuming habits uh, are dictated by culture. And not just uh, consuming habits, also the, our lifestyles uh, derive from culture. So for example, there is a whole sort of culture built around uh, uh, the automobile or motorcycles. As, uh, so, and this, this culture comes to symbolize, if you like, a kind of uh, freedom. So Peter Fonda, you know, on his motorcycle becomes uh, uh, an image of freedom. And especially in America, but also increasingly, I would say, in India, uh, the <coughs> uh, cars have come to symbolize the same kind of freedom, if you like. And I think that's one of the very important roles that, uh, that keeps, in fact, uh, 
the internal combustion engine, uh, you know, uh, uh, in business. So, for example, uh, you know, in, uh, in America now, uh, th there's this whole phenomenon of people who deface and vandalize electric cars. You know, they vandalize Teslas uh, because they feel that it's a kind of challenge to their um, lifestyle, to their way of life. Uh, and there are people, for example, who will not drive um, electric motorcycles because they like the noise you know, that, uh, that a gas-powered uh, uh, motorcycle makes. So there are all these kinds of strange uh, aesthetic attachments, you know, which we don't usually take into account, but which are increasingly becoming so obvious. You know, for example, the lawn, uh, you know, the, the green lawn uh, for a garden, uh, that was invented uh, uh, in England in the 17th century, uh, and it became more and more popular. And, uh, you know, through, say, books like the works of Jane Austen and so on. And now you see lawns being created in the most unsuitable locations. For example, if you go to, uh, if you go to the United Arab Emirates, you'll see that, you know, they, their fresh water, uh, they actually have to purify the water using enormous quantities of energy in order to do that. They, uh, you know, they desalinate a seawater. You would think that this water is very precious and must be spent very carefully. But no, they spend uh, a, a lot of this water on trying to maintain lawns. Lawns and sort of English style gardens. It's a kind of absolute madness. So in California, which is a very water stressed environment, in Arizona, which is literally desert, they've been spending, uh, you know, enormous amounts of water on trying to maintain lawns. Uh, recently, actually, I, I believe California has uh, actually uh, started rationing water, and one of the first steps in rationing water is preventing people uh, from watering their lawns. But the, the weird part of it is, why in a, in a situation like that, would you want to have a lawn in the first place? You know? So these are completely derived from patterns of culture. Yes, I've even heard that um, they use coloring to color their lawns green because they're not allowed to water, <laughs> water them. And so yeah, it's, as you say, a madness and it's strange. <laughs> but speaking of that, uh, the Anthropocene, you also mentioned in your book that the Anthropocene is a challenge for the arts and for the academic fields of the humanities in, in that it's, you need to create an understanding of climate change and its impacts. But do we need a new language to cope with, cope and understand climate change? Well, a new language has come into being whether we need it or not. <laughs> I mean, who, for example, I mean, the word Anthropocene in the first place. But also, I mean, like these new, so many new neologisms that we are, that we are learning about every day, like a glof, uh, you know, the glacial lake outburst flood, you know, which is such an important phenomenon now, uh, especially in the trans-Himalayan region. So, I mean, a new language is absolutely coming into being, uh, you know, whether or not we like it. I mean, who'd ever heard of uh, saltwater intrusion? You know, but that's a thing. I mean, you know, and uh, we uh, we have to cope with all these uh, all these new sorts of impacts. Have you changed your own language through uh, through time? I think we all have to. We can't help it. I mean, and actually, that's one of the reasons why it's so hard to write about uh, these uh, these uh, you know phenomena like that in any kind of lyrical or poetical way. Uh, you know. How do you write about a rain bomb, <laughs> you know? How do you, how do you write a poem about a rain bomb? It's not easy, you know. Have you tried? <laughs> nope. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, you mentioned the glaciers in the Himalayas, and uh, they are melting at an alarming rate, and this makes the fl flow of water in the great rivers of South Asia uh, more insecure and they're shifting and they don't, are not as predictable as earlier for farmers and locals. 
uh, which means both floods and droughts throughout the whole uh, region uh, when it affects millions of people who live along these rivers uh, or non, not non-rivers anymore in these days. Uh, so you can, in South Asia you can see a much higher or rate or it's more um, uh, you can see it more in your everyday life in South Asia compared to, for instance, Sweden. And I know that you live part of the year in India and part of the year in the West. Uh, so how is climate change discussed in these two places, in, in India, and do you see any change in the way you discuss it from between India and the West? Um. I would have to say that even though there's a fair amount of like, uh, you know, greenwashing that happens in India, uh, that climate change is actually uh, not discussed very much. Uh, even, uh, even now, I remember there was a terrible drought in 2016. Uh, and, the, you know, this drought displaced uh, tens of millions of people. It created havoc in the, in the country. That was when this book came out, you know, in India. And I happened uh, to be in Delhi at that time. Uh, the Indian parliament had one session on the drought, and that was attended by less than 10% of the members of parliament. Uh, so unfortunately, this is something that we see around the world today, you know. Uh, we just see that our standard political procedures are completely unresponsive uh, to these uh, major issues. In fact, I think we can see everywhere in the world this phenomenon of state cap corporate capture of, of the state, you know. I don't know if that situation is uh, quite as bad here, but certainly, uh, I mean, if you look at the legislation being proposed today in uh, Great Britain, they're going to remove the last, uh, they're going to allow settlements in some of the last uh, protected areas. You know, and the same thing is happening in India. So, you know, at a moment when we should be strengthening our environmental regulations, actually exactly the opposite is happening. And the same is true again in, uh, uh, in America. Large parts of Alaska are being opened up to more and more uh, fossil fuel uh, extraction. You know, it's really hard to understate, to overstate the kind of uh, catastrophe that we are living through. And this catastrophe is partly due to climate, but it's also partly due to this uh, corporate capture, you know, uh, of the state that we see as a phenomenon uh, across the world now. Yeah, we very recently, uh, two weeks ago, we had an election in Sweden and we and the politicians running up to the election hardly mentioned climate change. So it's E equal madness here in Sweden. Uh, but when we talk about the, these differences, um, there are those who are, uh, who blame or at least are scared of the expanding economies of Asia, and which means, and consumption, which means that uh, a large, a very large population will uh, get better economy and more consume more and even though the fossil fuel intense West is uh, really to blame for the accelerated climate change, you're right that these thoughts comes from a notion of, of uh, we and them, uh, but you also mentioned that it's no use because within climate change there is no other. I found that very interesting, can you elaborate a bit on that? Yeah, well, you know, what has happened really over the last 30 years is that there's been a very small expansion in the per capita footprint, uh, carbon footprint of people in Asia. But simply because there are so many people in Asia, even that small expansion in that carbon uh, footprint uh, has made uh, a huge impact upon the atmosphere. Well, one of the things that shows us most of all is that, uh, it, you know, is something that uh, Gandhi pointed to uh, 
1921 uh, when he said that, you know, if, if we in India start living like people in the West do, then we will devour the world like locusts. Uh, and that's what exactly what we are seeing. I mean, so what Asia's experience really shows is that this kind of a carbon intensive economic uh, life was never possible for everybody in the world. It was only ever possible for very small minorities, you know. And now, but unfortunately, you know, uh, for the last, I mean, you know, from 1990 onwards, when uh, the Washington consensus comes into being, there's a huge push to globalize American lifestyles, you know. Uh, every, the American lifestyle with two cars and, you know, various kinds of gadgets, all energy intensive, uh, was held up as the ideal way of li living, you know. And I think this has been the greatest catastrophe, really, you know. Because obviously, everybody can't live like Americans, you know. Everybody doesn't have another continent to go and snatch and, uh, you know, uh, take all the resources and destroy all the indigenous peoples. That's not possible. So what we are seeing today, really, um, I would say, in India, in China, Indonesia, is really what you might call a kind of auto-colonization, you know, where completely settler colonial methods of extractivism are being, uh, are, are being imposed upon uh, indigenous peoples, you know. Thank you very much. I think we are running out of time. Uh, but um, I do urge you to read Amitav's books, and especially this one on the climate change. And it gives you somewhat of an understanding of, <laughs> and you point out many good points at least. And I don't know if I understand more, but it's good. <laughs> Please read it. Thank you very much for joining us here today. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Andrew. Thank you.